Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. In this class, I want to do the second part to the stuff on the demonic. We, In the first class, I talked about the ways in which demons influence people and how they affect people. And so now I want to talk about how you keep them at bay. And there's a number of different things. I don't have them really in order. I just threw them all down when I, because I just didn't have a whole lot of time to get it done. So I just got it all down. Um, and so hopefully it will be pretty much everything, at least the basics that you need to know. There's a number of different things that you can do that can help in a, a great deal. One of the things that the authors talk quite a bit about, especially exorcists, but a lot of them talk quite a bit about is prayer. A consistent prayer life every single day will be one of the principal ways to keep them at bay since you don't become influenced, especially in relationship to the extraordinary influence, such as oppression, um, obsession, and um, uh, possession. But there is, uh, but specifically meditation. There's something about meditation that tends to break, especially in cases of, of obsession, but the meditation is very useful to to praying for, to break the uh, oppression. People who are possessed have to get into a habit of praying daily because as they pray, it weakens the demonic influence over the course of time. Um, also in relationship to different, so meditation is really good for um, possession, or it's for, good for all, but it's particularly good for obsession. For oppression, there's two things that are really useful the one is um, one that Our Lady herself promised that those who pray a devotion to the Sorrowful Heart, say a novena to the Sorrowful Heart of our uh, Sorrowful Mother, she will actually provide. Um, she'll actually drive the demonic out. So it's one of the principal ways in which you can do that. Um, and then also saying the Chaplet of Divine Mercy every single day for the intention of keeping them at bay. Now there's some prayers which I'll talk about a little bit later, which can also help some specific um, prayers. Then there is fasting and mortification. Fasting. So if a person gets into the habit of fasting, I usually try and tell people if you can get to the point where you can fast um, every Wednesdays and every Wednesdays and all Wednesdays and Fridays, that will pretty much conquer any ability of theirs to influence you because they stay away from people who tend to fast regularly. By fast, I normally tell people follow the church's fasting rules. Don't go to excess. If you're going to do much more than that, you should sit down with a priest who can make sure that you know. Um, what you're doing, because I have seen people who fast too excessively, and then in the end, what ha what happens is, is um, you know, they end up affecting their health or something of that sort. <clears throat> something in which you want to get into, because fasting is actually a virtue. Um, it has different opposites. Its opposite is gluttony or starving or some of the different kinds of dis eating disorders. So the virtue lies in the mean, in which a person eats moderately, but also it, from time to time will fast, just to help the moderation. Um, our Lord said, of course, you know, the apostles went out and they were, the disciples went out and they were trying to drive out the demons and they were successful except for with a few of them. And they asked our Lord, why couldn't we drive them out? And he said, this kind of demon can only be cast out by prayer and fast. So that there are certain, certain demons that just require a certain amount of prayer and fasting to be done before you're going to get rid of them. In the process of this fasting, you'll be developing virtue, and developing virtue in all areas is very useful for keeping demons at bay, especially from in relationship to the ordinary me, the ordinary things they do, such as temptation, but also um, in relationship to um, things like obsession. The reason being is, is because through virtue, our emotional life becomes more subordinated to reason, so that it's harder for the demons to make use of our emotions in relationship to us. So that once a person reaches a certain level of virtue, they rarely will act upon the emotion directly or the appetite directly to cause the emotion. Now we talked about in the last class how they can affect, they can introduce images into our imagination, but they can also move our appetites or our emotions. And what happens is when a person reaches a certain level of virtue, they stop going after the the um, emotional life directly, normally speaking, because of the fact that it's too perceptible to the person of virtue that this isn't from him, from himself. And so what they'll do is they'll first try and introduce the thought, so they'll try the temptation more into the thought first. And then when the normal appetite arises from that, then they'll come in and help it strengthen that appetite. But they'll usually, they'll try and stay away from that, so then it becomes a matter of the thought, just getting the thoughts under control. 
um, which comes through the virtue of custody of the mind, um, which is one of the principal ways, not only in relationship to temptation, but in relationship to things uh, such as obsession. Even people who are possessed have to practice it to keep them, to try and help keep them at bay. There is um, the uh, general principle with demons, which I think I've mentioned in this class before, but John of the Cross mentions that in relationship to God, they say if you have any type of extraordinary phenomenon that occurs to you, you just ignore it. If it's from God, he doesn't need you. So he's, he's going to accomplish whatever it's pointing to or whatever he wants done anyway without you. So don't you just ignore it and um, it's, not going to, uh, it's not going to hurt you at all spiritually. In fact, that's what God expects you to do because in this life it's too easy for God to act upon us. But the demons can produce a lot of the same types of signs and same types of things. And so St. John of the Cross says if you ignore it, they can't get anything out of it. Because the only way they can have any influence is if we pay attention to it. And that is exampled by Eve. When Satan came and animated or whatever he did to portray the serpent... Eve saw that. Now, the fathers of the church say that Eve knew, because of infused knowledge, who the angels were and also who the demons were. So that in point, in fact, when she saw this, she knew, the fathers say, she knew this was not from God. And yet, because of her curiosity, she allowed herself, she, in other words, she was tempted with curiosity in seeing that, and she allowed herself to be sucked into that. And that meant that it sets up two things. First is, is that one of the principal ways in which demons suck people in is through curiosity. This is why I keep telling everybody you have to avoid charismatic prayer groups and things like that because it's based on curiosity. It's a signs and wonders movement. But the second thing is, and I've, as I mentioned before, I've actually had to pray for people who were, became obsessed or possessed, not possessed, but obsessed and oppressed as a result of being involved in those movements. So I tell people to stay away from them. But anyway, that being said, um, but the, the second thing is, is that it means that the demons can only get something out of us if we pay attention to them. So you have to have custody of the mind, custody of the eyes, and you just ignore them. And it's the same thing with these other kinds of phenomena. When you have extraordinary phenomena occur, you just ignore it. And it's the same thing with relationship to temptation. You just ignore it. You've got to get your mind off. So that's one of the virtues. Custody of the mind and custody of the senses will help tremendously to get um, to keep the demons at bay. And they'll, they'll find different ways to try and get your attention, but if you just keep your mind off it, you're in good shape. The next is called a binding prayer, which I have copies of it here. I didn't make that many of them. But um, it's just a, it, it basically just goes spirit of, and then you name the type of behavior like you're being tempted with. So if it's to lust or if it's to anger or um, if it's to um, sloth because you want to spend large amounts of time sitting in front of TV or something like that, you just name the thing that it's tempting you or sadness. It can even be like if you're having a hard time getting control of your emotions, you can name the emotion. So you'd like say spirit of sadness or spirit of lust. I bind you in the name of Jesus and then it goes on. Um, and you can even say it for other people. It's particularly effective for people who are married. For if one person is being affected by, uh, and the marriage is being affected by it, because in marriage, when you get married, you exchange bodily rights. Now, one of the things that demons pay very close attention to, which I think I mentioned in the last class, is the authority structure. That is the divine economy regarding the authority structure. And what that basically means is, is they have a very, they have an absolute understanding of exactly how authority functions the degree of authority a particular individual has over whom he has it, etc. And so they, they, they pay very close attention to that. And so what, and they have their subject to it as well. They're still subject, even though they're obnoxious and tend to try and subvert that authority. The fact of the matter is they still have to observe it. So if somebody is married, when you get married, you exchange bodily rights, which means your spouse has rights over your body. That means that if they say binding prayers or prayers for the spouse, it's actually more efficacious than, say, someone else, all other things being equal. So that's one of the things spouses very often will find that it has a tremendous impact when one of them is really suffering or really going through something, like they're really, they become angry and have a hard time dealing with it. The other spouse will say a binding prayer on that, 
and it'll have a tremendous impact. All of a sudden, the person feels a kind of lightning. And you can do this with your children, because your children are part of the authority structure, etc. You can do it with other people, but you have to be kind of moderated. Don't go around binding everybody and everything. The other thing is, because of the fact that um, sometimes you have to deal a little bit with the fallout, because um, if you bind somebody over and there is a demon who is particularly fond of the thing, he may take it out on you. So you have to have a certain level of spiritual um, fortitude, which is one of the reasons why I usually tell people that in the beginning you should really only be doing it with yourself and with your, your family, and then you can extend it to your friends and so on, um, based upon where you're kind of at in the spiritual life. Binding prayers can also work for people who are spiritually blind. There was a case one time when I was sitting with, a, with an exorcist. We were sitting with this um, guy who just refused to accept the natural arguments to prove that God existed. So he started out with saying, okay, you know, all things are in motion. Motion has to have a cause because you can't go back in infinitely in things that were caused in motion. Eventually, you've got to get to something that started the motion, etc. So he goes to this argument, and he would get to the guy right to the point where the, then the next conclusion was, and this thing is called God, and he would refuse to accept the conclusion. He would go back and try and deal with the but you'd get him right to the point where he'd accept that. And so finally, he asked, he's, he, he, says, he says, I just don't think we can know anything about God. Well, being a philosopher, that was the wrong question to ask me, or the statement to make around me. So I just said, what do you mean by the word no? And it just stunned him for a minute. And then that gave the exorcist time to do a binding prayer on it. And after that, he accepted the argument. So this is something that can actually be helpful. Like if you're finding your spouse is having a hard time praying or they don't want to um, really be serious about their spiritual life, you can say the binding prayers to keep the demons at bay that might be affecting that. So those are some of the things that you can do. It's particularly effective for temptations and all those other things as I mentioned. Then there is also the commission of the care of body and soul, which is a prayer that I've, I've got. There's three different versions of it. It's very useful. If people get into the habit of saying that every day, that'll pro, um, provide them a great deal of protection. Now, usually when people start saying that prayer, there's kind of an increase in um, dreaming activity for a while. And the dreams become a little bit more intense, a little bit more frequent, but then they'll, they'll kind of pan out. Usually. Not always, but usually. Okay, and then there is self-exorcism, which we saw our Lord do. When Peter came up and started tempting him, our Lord said, or, you know, don't go to Jerusalem, and our Lord said, Satan, get behind me. So that in point of fact, we can exercise Satan out of ourselves in a certain, to a certain degree, and that's what the binding prayers do. But it's also, you can just say it directly, you know, like, um, get behind me. And that actually serves a very useful function, because if you're being tempted in any way, um, then what happens is, is when you shift the attention to, you know, to going on the attack to the demonic, now, not all our temptations and temptations, as I mentioned before, from the demonic. As I mentioned again, Satan's not under every rock. Can I ask you a question, Father? Yeah. Um, was Satan speaking through Peter? Well, he was, he was, he was the one who probably placed the thought in Peter. And so as a result, Peter would say, oh, that's a good idea. He shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And so he brings this up, and he says, no. And Christ knows the source of it. And that's why he says, get behind me. So it, it, as you go on the attack, it does two things. One, because as I mentioned, not every temptation is from Satan. Because of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three sources of temptation. And so, but Satan can make use of the world and the flesh. Uh, but it's one of those things, he's not under every rock. He's under every other rock. And if you put that rock back down and try and find him and lift up the other rock, you go back to the other rock and there he is again. You know, he wasn't there before, but now he's there. It's one of those kinds of things. So, but, um, so he's not under every rock, but at the same time, it's one of those things that if you, if you do the self-exorcism, it's, it's analogous to us with dogs. If you see a dog snapping and snarling every time you walk by, even though you haven't even touched the thing, you're not likely to go up and start, you know, petting the thing because you might get your hand bit off. Well, it's the same thing in relationship with demons with us. They don't want to get involved with us unless it's necessary. They have to if they know they're just going to get their uh, intellect chewed at, so to speak. That's to put it more formally. But anyway, in other words, if they're going to get their hand bit off, they're not going to get involved with you. Well, it's the same kind of a thing. So if you go on the attack regularly, they're less likely to do it or the, the attacks will become more subtle so you won't get the more strong, overt types of temptations. Um, but the other thing is, it gets your mind off the thing that you're being tempted about. Just get your mind off it, and that's one of the principal things that you want to do. 
The next is frequent reception of the sacraments is also recommended, especially daily mass, going to mass daily. Uh, and if possible, frequent confession. And by frequent, there, it depends. There's kind of a range. If you're talking about somebody who's trying to stay out of mortal sin, and they're just, you know, they want to conquer mortal sin, they're just trying to stay out of it, they should be going to confession once a week. Because it's through that once a week that you'll, the, the sacramental graces will be renewed and the person will have the strength in order to avoid it. But if um, it's the type of thing that you're in the habitual state of grace, it is you're, you're not falling into mortal sin, you're going a while without falling into mortal sin, then you should be going at least once a month, or more often if you're trying to advance in the spiritual life. But the, the exorcists say that confession is actually more efficacious than going through a formal exorcism. And it can have a tremendous impact in, the uh, in weakening the demonic, um, even whether it's extraordinary or ordinary phenomenon. So frequent confession, receiving of the Eucharist daily, if you can, is uh, very important. And part of this is, is, is the general principle. It's a general principle. It's not an absolute. But it's a general principle that if you're leading a normal Catholic life, and by that I mean a devout Catholic life where you're going to Mass Sundays, Holy Days of Obligation, getting confession regularly, receiving other sacraments when necessary, your odds of becoming influenced are very rare. But that doesn't mean that you can't. I mean, you still can. There was a case of a nun, I think I might have mentioned this. There was a case of a nun who was a devout nun. There's no indication that she had ever done anything to incur it, but she became possessed in Iowa. I don't know if I mentioned this in the last class, but she became possessed. And during the exorcism, they were beating out of the demons, okay, what was the cause? And they said um, there was a particular sin in the region, and God wanted atonement for this sin, and that's why she became possessed. So it may not be a failure fault of her own. Now, that doesn't mean you should be panicking, running around, fretting, oh, I'm going to get possessed. You know, I'm trying to lead a good life. I'm going to be possessed. As I mentioned before, your spouse might already think that, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is that it's very, very rare that you would become possessed or obsessed or these other things if you're doing normal Catholic life. Now, things can happen to you that can still introduce the demonic into your life through no fault of your own, but that's, um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last class, but it was something I was hinting at, at the homily on the ascension, that sometimes God will allow things to happen to people because... He wants them to recognize their weakness, and the lower he brings them down to recognize that weakness, the higher he ultimately wants to lift them up, because what he's trying to do is bring them to a more absolute adherence to his assistance. So the lower he brings you, the more... And that, Now here I'm not talking about doing your own sin. That's your own problem. But I'm talking about in the sense of when people start advancing, sometimes there's a sense of despair um, or things of that sort, and God's doing that in order to raise people up ultimately. So it's frequent reception of the sacraments. Sacramentals, now there's a number of different sacramentals. And the first are metals. There's different metals for different things that can actually ward off the demonic. So for instance, if you're having a hard time converting people, or if there's a particular location that is, is um, there's evil things going on and you want to conquer them, the miraculous metal can sometimes do that. Another one is um, the St. Benedict medal, which I have up here. Um, if you would like, I just, they're already blessed, so I can't sell them to you, but the parish did pay for it, so if you, 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 don't, you don't have to put the money in now, but if you take some of them, just um, give a donation to the church so that I can buy some more. That's why I ask people to do it and keep, it, keep the flow coming, so to speak. But the St. Benedict medals are particularly efficacious, and the reason being, well, first of all, make sure you get them blessed in the old rite and not in the new. In the new rite, it's a simple blessing. There's no exorcism to my knowledge that's attached to it. In the old rite, there's a full-blown exorcism plus a blessing. Um, there's specific prayers are asked that they, this is used to drive the demonic out, so it's very efficacious. St. Benedict medals can be, you can wear them. I usually tell people if you wear a scapular, which is something which I'll talk about in a minute, if you wear a scapular, you can actually add it to the scapular to get, uh, to get some protection. So you can carry it on your uh, own person. Um, in, the, in relationship to your house, there's different levels of protection. And just having one in the house provides a certain level of protection. But the common thing to do is to, to take them and bury them in the four corners of, the, of your property. Now, we're not talking about the same kind of thing where you every so often someone will bring me a statue of St. Joseph. And the first thing I ask them is, what are you using this for? Because inevitably it's, I'm putting the statue upside down because I, no, that's superstition and it's just going to cause you trouble. 
So I'll tell them, I'll bless the statue, put it in your house and pray to him, and then you'll get your house sold. But the, the metals are different. You want to actually bury them, bury them in the four corners of your property or put them in the four corners of your property, whichever um, is the case. If, you're, if it's cement all around, you're not going to be able to bury them. Or if you live in an apartment or something like that, you can just put them in the four corners. And that will help to ward out the demonic. That's just kind of common. If you're having particular difficulties in the house, it's, it's common that the exorcist will say to put the St. Benedict medals over every entrance to the house. That means the house. The, doors and the windows. Now, why that? I mean, demons can walk right through the walls. I mean, they don't even walk. They just change their mind where they want to act upon, and that's where they're at. Well, for some reason or another, there's something about the physical laws that they also have to observe in a certain respect. And so uh, exorcists will talk about how demons will actually enter the house through a window or things of this sort. So I, I theologically... I'm not sure exactly what it means other than what I told you. There's something about the physical laws that even they have to observe. So that's why you put them over the, um, usually over the top. You don't have to nail them in. Some people just tape them on the top, um, and then that'll actually provide a certain amount of protection. Um, you can also put them on things that uh, behave strangely. Uh, I'm not suggesting you tape one to your kid's forehead. <laughs> but but it is the type of thing that you can put them on, like if your computer's acting up for no reason or another, although today with the complexity of software, it's hard to know whether it's some little thing they've worked in there to make your life miserable or if it's actually the machine. But you can actually put it on computers, on your, keep one in your car, that type of thing. There was a case of a guy whose daughter got involved in witchcraft and he had nothing but trouble with that stuff in the house. And he went out to the car. I think I might have mentioned this last time. But he went out to the car, wouldn't start, goes back in. You know, I don't know if he prayed or not. Comes out about five minutes later, goes out. The car would start, but it wouldn't go in gear. So then he goes back. And here we're talking about an almost new car. There was nothing mechanically wrong with it. And this is the types of things that you can experience. So if you put them, you know, again, if your car is a pile of junk and it's, you know, well, put the miraculous medal or I'll put a St. Benedict medal and hopefully it won't break down. But on the other hand, they can act upon these things. And so if you put them in there, that provides a certain level of protection. Um, so anything that might act strangely, um, you can put them in there. Okay, and they're, they're really, really useful. Scapulars are good to wear because the scapular by its very nature, is a bre it, it signifies a breastplate by which you're given protection from Our Lady. And so it's one of the things that uh, I highly recommend. There's different sacred images. Just having sacred images in your home annoy demons um, and that type of thing. So, um, And also carrying sacred images like um, in your wallet or your purse or things like that of the saints that you're particularly fond of and that type of thing. These can be really useful. The next is holy oil. Now here we're not talking about the oil that's destined for the sacrament of the sick or for extreme unction. That has a different kind of a blessing and it's not to be used except for in those particular cases. That is for the sacrament. To use it outside that is normally sacrilege, so we tell people don't do that. But there is a blessing in the old rite ritual which actually um, places a blessing on the oil, but it also asks that through the oil, so there's a kind of an exorcism that's placed on it, that through the oil it may drive the demons out. There was a case of an exorcist who the, these parents called him up and said, I don't know what it is, my kids are just all of a sudden acting really goofy, I can't get them to calm down. So he just went over to their house, took the oil out, and put it on their forehead. The kids were like, eh, and as soon as he put the for stuff on the forehead, they're just like, <laughs> like that, and that was it. So. Now, you're probably not going to get that same kind of reaction out of your kid, but um, it does actually have its effect. And you can, for parents, it's good to put that on the child's forehead every night and on their own foreheads. Just to make sure we're clear about something regarding blessings, children cannot bless their parents. This authority of divine structure that I was talking about, this economy that God sets up, is that blessings come from an authority. They come down, not up. And your kid's below you, so your kid can't. So every so often you'll see people, they'll bless their kid with a they'll take their, and this is parents can do this, they can take their thumb and just place a, a sign of the cross on the kid's forehead. And that's a form of a blessing because of the office of parents, they can, which is an authority thing, they can actually bless their children. But then they'll say, okay, now you bless me. Sorry, can't do it. Because I don't have any, any 
any office or anything to bless your parent, the parents. So they can't do it. Well, I can bless my parents now because I'm a priest, obviously. But the point being is, is that normally children can't do that. So it should be the parents doing it. But anyway, putting that all aside, it's good to have um, to use the hoi oil on your kids regularly, especially if they're kind of acting up, if they're going through a difficult time. If you have teenagers in the house, it's a really good idea to get them into the practice of using it. It's also a really good idea to use it in cooking. Now, you have to understand what that means. You don't fry your bacon in it. <laughs> what it means is, is that you can, you can use it, you can use it on salads, and then you should normally wipe it up so that it's, there's no sacrifice, or make sure that when you're washing it, all the oils are broken up so that the blessing is dispersed on relationship to it. But um, you can use it, you can consume it, use it in food, um, use it when you're, even in cooking, if the cooking is the type of thing that will go into the material, into the thing, like if it's in bread or something like that, I don't know what people would use it for, but it's going to be dispersed into it, not just in the water, so it gets poured down the drain. But if it's going to be actually used in something, then you can do that. And it will actually have its effect. I usually tell people that you want to have that in the house with teenagers regularly and feed them to it, keep them a steady diet of it. Because it'll actually help them when they're going through difficult periods, especially today because of our culture. It will really actually help them. They may not know it, you know. Now, I don't suggest you speed, you can put some on the it here. <laughs> but unless they've got a particularly bad mouth, so you're, instead of the soap, you're getting the hall. <laughs> but uh, the point being is, is that you can also put it on anything else that's influenced by the demonic. So sometimes people will actually... Um, in addition to the St. Benedict medals will go throughout, the, if you don't want to put St. Benedict medals all over the house because you don't think they have any difficulties, you can actually do the holy oil over the entrance to all the entrances to the home in this form of a cross. Normally it should be done by the man of the household, but in the absence of him or if he doesn't want to do it, then his wife can do it. Then you can also um, put it on other things that act up. I don't suggest you pour it on your computer and things like that, but you can, you can you know, make signs of the cross over those things in order to, with the oil, and that will actually help um, to keep those things at bay. Okay, so you can put it on in, uh, on things, you can make the sign of the cross, you discover its influence in houses, as I mentioned, over the doors. Um, it's also done when exercising a house. Um, make sure you make sufficient inquiry into your neighbors. I mentioned this in a homily down in Lincoln. I said, when you move into a neighborhood, find out what your neighbors are like. And they, they were all perplexed because I was giving a homily on witchcraft. Or is it like olive oil? It's just it's an extra virgin olive oil, and then the priest blesses it, and then you can use it in cooking and stuff like that, provided it's all consumed in some way. When you're making the sign of the cross on the windows and over the doors, is there anything special we should say? No. Okay. Just you just use it and make it make it over there. So make sure you pay attention to who your neighbors are. There was this one. I actually made this statement down in, uh, in, in Kansas City from the pulpit, which kind of stunned people. But I said, because uh, this guy, I learned this lesson. This friend of mine decided, because he was going to buy a house out in the country, and he was going to grow tobacco. And I'm like, as it turns out, his wife sees this house in town, and she's like, i got to have this house. So he buys the house. And it turned out to be a complete nightmare. The house turned out to be possessed. So after a year and a half, we finally got the thing cleaned up, we think. But anyway, that's when I learned the lesson, you never give your wife what she wants. <laughs> you give her what you know is going to make her happy. And sometimes those are the same and sometimes they're not. The one thing that we always have to remember is that demons love places. They love just as much as we do. For them, their attachment to a place is based upon the sin or evil committed in the place. If you discover that something demonic or by witchcraft is done in a house or in some other place, it's a good idea to ask a priest to bless or exercise that particular place. Now, this means, of course, like if you find your your son doing something he's not supposed to be doing sometime, you know, some morning or something, it's not the type of thing, oh, I'm going to bring a priest in and exercise the house. What I'm saying, though, is, is that if you find out, like, your daughter was playing, you know, got involved with witchcraft and she was, you know, trying some spells out, but then she stopped or something like that, <clears throat> it's a good idea to have the priest come in and clean it up because these things are quickly brought in that way. Then there is the use of votive candles that are blessed in the old rite. Again, not in the old, in the new. Because in the new rite, they don't have the. Um, there's actual section in the new in the old rite where the blessing on the candle asks specifically that through the burning of the candle, it'll drive the demons out. And I mentioned this in the last class. There's demons of the air. They get into the air. They take take possession of the air by people's virtue of people's blasphemy and things of this sort. 
so they can take possession of the air, and these will actually drive the demons of the air out. As I mentioned, uh, demons of the air are mentioned in Scripture, they're mentioned by Our Lady of La Salette, and by saying this, it'll actually draw, uh, drive the demons of the air out. And so I usually recommend for people to actually have, um, to have it done in the old rite, the blessing done in the old rite. Not just the blessing, but also the water the priest puts on actually um, is also exercised. So as it burns, the, um, the residue from that gets into the air and it drives them out. The same thing regarding incense. You can burn incense to do this, have the same kind of an effect. Uh, yeah. When we, you're talking about candles and having a blessing, you're not talking about all of our little votive candles and stuff, are you? Everyone. Every candle you burn in your house, you should get blessed. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's even if it's just your party lights, <laughs> get them blessed. Can you, you give could, us, yeah. Oh. Can you give us an example of blasphemy, how it occludes the air? Well, basically, what it what it boils down to is is that anytime you make ill use of a physical thing. You, may, you basically are using the thing in such a way that you place it under the order of the demonic. Now, not every time that happens do they take possession of the thing or have control of it, but in the case of air, if people say blasphemous words by means of the, because they have to use the air to do that, then the demons can actually take possession of the air. And there's actually, I mentioned this before, there's a, um, a blessing for um, driving them out in storms, which I've seen effectively used. Because they can take possession of the air, it can become cumulative, this is, uh, so also you can use this with incense, it's particularly useful in this regard. This also has a connection to the incense used at Mass. This is one of the reasons why it was used at Mass and should be used at Mass. And it's also uh, the same thing with the asparagus at Mass. When the priest is um, blessing people going through the thi thing, you can actually, you know, drive the demons out of people. Now, I'm not suggesting that it does it all the time, because not everybody's possessed, not everybody's that type of thing. But, can also fortify people or protect people, provide a certain level of protection for people. Then there's holy water. Again, use the old rite holy water. In the absence of a new, uh, of the old rite holy water, use the new, because the new rite, even just with a simple blessing, which they use in the new rite, does have the capacity to drive out the demonic. It's just not the same kind of a level type of thing. Because in the old rite, you exercise and bless the salt, so there's a twofold side of it that the demons don't like. That's placed in water that is exercised first, then blessed. And then there is epiphany water, which has a double exorcism attached to it, which is also very useful. Easter water also has uh, a certain efficacy in that regard. Not the baptismal water, but the actual Easter water. But if you use the old rite holy water, because it's, it's basically more efficacious. And this is something that exorcists have noticed. Now, one of the things that you can do to double up on the power of your holy water is take a couple of drops of the oil that you have blessed and add it to the holy water. And that will also add, in addition to that, then the exorcisms and the blessings from the holy oil, of water, oil are added to the water and it becomes that much more efficacious. It is a good idea to spread the holy water throughout the house and on people and things. You can do this regularly. I usually tell people if you've got teenagers, do it regularly, like once a week or once a month. Um, not because I think teenagers are wicked, necessarily. <laughs> but just because of the fact that they're more prone to falling into things and that type of thing, and this will really help them a great deal. It may all be also be consumed uh, by those who are having problems. So sometimes, like, if it's there's a particular temptation or obsession or some kind of possession that people can actually consume the holy water. I'm not suggesting you sit there and consume large quantities of it, unless you're seriously possessed, but it will actually have uh, an effect, um, especially if you're suffering from stomach problems or things like that that don't seem to have any real, like, where is this coming from, that type of thing. Then there is exercise salt, which um, is the first part of the blessing and the blessing of holy water. So as I mentioned, you exercise and bless the salt, you exercise, and then you exercise and bless the water. Well, you can take this, you can just use that part for the salt, and then people can use the salt. You can use it in cooking, you can spread it throughout your home, you can consume it, put it in your salt shakers, that type of thing, and that will actually begin to have, um, that can actually have an effect. Again, that's one of those things that um, you can use in teenagers. There was an institution I was at one time, and um, I was concerned about some of the people that were there. So I exercised all the salt in the place, and the next day, two of the people I was a little worried about got ill. So that can sometimes tell you something about, hmm, I wonder what he's into, you know, or what their problem is. 
Now, I'm not suggesting you do this as some type of diagnostic for your disease. You put this in, if your head gets a little bigger or swells and turns around, that's not what I'm saying. That's not how it works. But the fact of the matter is, is if you're, if you're feeding your kids this stuff on a, as a regular diet, their temptations are going to be less. They're going to um, suffer a lot less of difficulties and that type of thing. So you can use it in cooking. Um, and as I mentioned, you can do, sprinkle it around the house or in places where there are particular difficulties. Then there are relics of saints, and particularly the relic of the saint of the day. So if you're really, you know, if you're suffering a lot of temptations and there happens to be a relic of the saint of the day in the church or something of that sort, then it's good to venerate that, and then as a result, you can, you know, it'll actually help. The, then, oh, I didn't bring it with me. There is a relic that you can give um, at a place, it's um, in Italy. There's, I think that's how it's spelled, I think. This might be a little bit differently. But it's the San Juario, San Miguel. And what it is, is it's, it's a place where St. Michael appeared. He appeared, I think, five times over the course of history. The first time, I think, was in 436. He appeared and he said, I've chosen this cave, um, and I want people to take parts of the stones from the cave and use them. And I've had really good success on a number of different levels with this. You have to be careful with this, so be patient. It may take a while to get it. But if you send them $50 as a donation and ask for one of the stones, they'll send it in a little reliquary. Um, we just, the seminary, um, guys at the seminary got a whole bunch of them recently. And they're really good. I've had, like I said, I've had good luck with it. Um, and so that's one of the things that you can get. Then there's the relic of the true cross. Uh, your odds of getting something like that are extremely rare. Usually the only people that have access to those are pastors in particular parishes, like we have one here, or exorcists or things of this sort have them, because the church is rather parsimonious with giving them out. Um, obviously because you don't want to exhaust all the wood in the cross, but those um, are very efficacious under certain circumstances. So, but, some priests have found if they bless people somewhat regularly with it, that people will find relief from temptations and things of that sort. Then there's this thing called the Agnus Dei, and what that is is that's a it's a piece of wax from the cross or the the candle blessed in the Vatican um, on Easter on the Easter Vigil. And if you can get parts of that, that is really efficacious as well. Um, once in a while, I'll come across somebody who happens manages to get one. But I, I've, I've, they're fairly rare. So different saints and that type of thing. Another way to drive out demons is by private and solemn ex by private exorcisms. Now, private exorcism is one which a priest can do without faculties. He doesn't have to get permission from the bishop or that type of thing. Um, and they're usually short. They don't usually last too long. There's different parts of it. There's some parts that are in the ritual, some parts... There's an actual book which one exorcist puts out, two exorcists, sorry, put it out for other exorcists and other priests, which contain a whole host of them. They have an abbreviated version of that. It's a yellow book, which um, contains the ones which lay people can say. They're just basic prayers. They're not exorcisms, but they're basic prayers. But this, um, they can say, the priests can say the prayers out of those. And certain parts of those are very efficacious depending on the circumstances. Being an exorcist is analogous to playing the pinata game. Because the demon is the guy standing there watching you trying and trying to bat the pinata. He's the pinata. But he gets to move around. You're blindfolded. And because he's far more intelligent than you are, so you're like and that's the way it is a lot of times with exorcism. You have to you have to keep trying different things until you find the things that they really don't like. And then that's the that's what you put the screws to them with. And so sometimes it takes time. So different. Sometimes people will find if they go through that yellow booklet, saying they'll say the different prayers that kind of stand out to them, and they'll find, well, this prayer is really good for me because I find when I pray this prayer, I, you know, and the symptoms or the effects are much more alleviated and that type of thing. And then there's a solemn exorcism, which is when the, pr the priest receives faculties from the bishop in order to do a uh, a, a full blown exorcism. Oh, let me back up. The other thing that protects you is this, remember this divine economy of authority. If you have some authority over the thing, you have some degree of protection. Now, in the case of the in the case of the priest, 
he has a certain amount of protection from his priesthood, but he also, once he receives faculties from the church, he also is protected even more by the church because he's invested with more authority. And that's the real thing that faculties provide. They provide authority which the priest does not have on his own. And so as a result, there is a significant difference, and the exorcist will tell you, there's a significant difference between doing a private exorcism, saying the exact same prayers under a private exorcism with no faculties and one with faculties. Can you tell us what faculties are? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Basically what it is is, you know that two keys you see in St. Peter? You always see these on um, reference to the Pope. Okay, well, what is gold? And that represents the power of orders. That is, the priesthood and the, the episcopacy and the diaconate that's passed on from generation to generation. And then there is a, a silver one. So the, the power of orders was given to the apostles on um, Monday, Thursday night, when Christ did the first Eucharist. The tradition of the church, the constant tradition of the church is, is that's when they were made priests. Okay. Then the silver one represents having the priesthood is a very different thing than having the right to make use of your priesthood. So for example, if I want to hear your confession, if I don't have the jurisdiction which the church grants to me, which is this other key, or this other power, then it's invalid. It doesn't even work. It's the same thing with if a priest does a confirmation without faculties, or that faculties is a name for receiving this jurisdiction, this power. If he doesn't receive it, then it's invalid. So this other key represents the, the first represents the what they call the... Um, holy orders, and this indicates that Christ conceded to the apostles. You remember right before, right, well, there's, it, it's, it's given in different, different stages. And at one point he gives it to St. Peter when he says to St. Peter, upon, you know, you're Peter and upon this rock I will build my church, but he also says whatever you bind in heaven, that was the first granting of the power of orders. So he was the first one to receive it. Then later he says it to the apostles. That's the one that's given to the bishops, basically. So there's, a, there's the second level. But then in the, right before he leaves, they didn't make use of it, though, their orders, until right before he leaves, he, sa he grants to them, he says, all power on heaven and earth is given to me. And he says, go therefore and baptize. That was the final commission of jurisdiction given to the church. And that's passed on from generation to generation. Now it's bound by a cord because it was the intention of our Lord that the power of orders and the power of jurisdiction, sometimes this is called the power of orders and the power of jurisdiction. That power of jurisdiction, it was never in our Lord, the intention was because he only gave jurisdiction to the apostles, that is to those who um, had holy orders, because of that, it was the it's divine intention that these things are never separated. So as a general rule, you don't give jurisdiction to lay people. It can be done under extreme circumstances, but normally speaking, it should not be given. Um, the other thing is, too, is that also meant that the exercise of holy orders should not normally be done without jurisdiction. And there are certain things in which you can't exercise <coughs> holy orders without jurisdiction. Now what happens is, is this jurisdiction is... It's, a, it's this authority structure that God gives, and the demons have to obey it. Our Lady even observes it, because of the fact that, if you recall, Our Lady never appeared and told anybody she was immaculately conceived until the Pope had stated it. Three years after the Pope stated it, then she appeared and said it. So the point being is that she, she even recognizes that this is an authority structure that God has set up, so I will observe it. And she's the queen of heaven, so she can get anything she wants anyway. But the point being is that even she observes it. So, in relationship to exorcisms, if the priest has this jurisdiction, if, he the, authority, if the church invests him with the authority to cast the demons out, and that's part of the jurisdiction is to drive out demons, it's far more efficacious than just trying to do it on his own. Uh, yeah. When would you have jurisdiction in our I don't remember which, like, maybe you said lady, you never... You don't want to separate them. No, but I mean, what, you said something about only under extreme circumstances. Extreme circumstances, you <coughs> would give jurisdiction to the laity. Yeah, under several necessity. I mean, like an example. Let's say, suppose you can't get to some guy in the bush in Africa. Suppose a priest isn't going to be there for another year and a half or two years. 
And so you may give a layman the jurisdiction to witness marriages so that the people actually have valid marriages or to shack them out. That would be an extreme example. Another, one example which they're doing now, which I do not like, is they're giving lay people jurisdiction to sit on tribunals and make judgments about annulment cases. I think that's just seriously daft. And there's a number of different reasons for that. But, that, not that I don't like lay people, but just that there's, certain, there's a certain place for certain things. Okay. Then there is a group called Auxilium Christianorum, which I mentioned in the last one. You can get their information at this website. This was started by two exorcists. They've got, it has ecclesiastical approbation. And basically, I've got some examples of the prayers here. Um, you can take them until they're, you're out of them. I printed about 10 of them. Basically, what it does is it, it's, it was started for two reasons. One, to help the exorcists themselves. They were alarmed at the fact that so many exorcists were having the charismatic renewal people get involved in this, and it was actually causing them trouble. So what they decided to do is say, okay, we got to get we got to get away from that practice. We need to start a group that prays because we do need their prayers. Their prayers are very efficacious in helping the exorcists also drive these things out. So they said we need their prayers. So they set up a group called Exilium Christianorum, and so they that one, there's two intentions they pray for. They pray for the people that the exorcists are trying to liberate. The second and the priests that are part of it, not necessarily all our exorcists. Um, when they say these private exorcisms, it can help. The second thing it does is it provides protection for the people and their families that are members. Now, as I mentioned, I think in the last class, I don't recommend people getting involved with this unless they've talked to a priest first or unless they have a really high level of spiritual life because there is a tremendous intensification usually that occurs when people start doing this. And usually one of the first things that happens is God starts stripping them of their ability to rely on themselves. It's one of the first effects. And it's a purification process. Most members go through it. And it's some, in some cases, it's very drastic. So you have to be, and not God, but then they'll usually notice in that process, there's a very subtle but very strong level of grace that's being provided. And what that God is doing is getting you to recognize you cannot win the spiritual warfare on your own. You'll just get mopped up because the demons are far more powerful and far more intelligent than we are. So the only way we can survive with this is by grace. And so that means we have to depend on God. Then I mentioned in the last class, spiritual contracts. And what spiritual contracts are um, is you, you say a prayer to, like, to our Lord or to Our Lady, and you say, each time I make the sign of the cross, I want this prayer to be remembered or to be, to have the, this. Each, so each time I make the sign of the cross, if you say the binding prayer, you know, you can say the binding prayer. Each time you say, you say God, each time I say this binding prayer, then you say the binding prayer. Um, I want this binding prayer to have this effect on me. So every time you make the sign of the cross, whether you're paying attention to it or not, it'll actually have its effect. Exorcists use this regularly in order to help the person begin to um, overcome. You can use it on anything whatsoever, any activity at all, but I usually tell people it should normally be associated with some type of religious activity. So you don't want people, you know, I don't want to be, be exaggerated, but you don't want people to say, well, each time I pick my nose, I want this to be, you know, because that, that's where people will get to it in no time flat, the way people are. So what you have to do is you just tell them, you know, each time you make the sign of the cross or each time you genuflect or something of that sort. And this can be really useful, you, if, especially like if you have, say, someone in your family that's having a lot of problems, then what you can do is you can actually say the, so, you know, each time I make the sign of the cross, make this binding prayer, help this person, you know, ward off the demons or something of that sort. And it will actually have its effect long term. Then there is devotion to the various saints. And the first is to Our Lady, obviously, because her relationship to demons is something um, unique in a certain sense. First of all, Satan fell because of her, and he brought everyone else down, which means her just her, their, their hatred for her, even if their sin was something else, it remotely is connected to that, so they just can't stand her. The second thing is, is that she uh, is the queen of heaven and earth. And again, we're back to this divine economy, this divine authority structure. And what happens in that case with Our Lady is she has, but she observes God's intention regarding how long the person is supposed to be influenced and that type of thing. But she has, practically speaking, absolute coercive power over the demons. She can drive, if God, 
if it's God's will that they drive them out, she just she just tells them you're out and they're out. So she's on a level that the rest of them aren't quite at. The rest of the saints aren't quite at. Now, there are times when God sends a particular saint to do this, but because she's queen of heaven, she has an authority that no other saint has. And so she's one of the most efficacious ones to get involved with. Then there's, of course, St. Michael, whose job it was to cast Satan out. And people should be praying the prayer to St. Michael and praying, uh, saying that regularly um, to him and just fostering a devotion to him. Then there's your guardian angel. Now, the way their angels function and the way saints function to a certain degree, too, is, remember this authority thing? Well, when you're created, God gives you authority over your body. Now, you can see that there's the a certain amount of that authority to the demons by what you do, by committing sin. Um, it can also be, you can also, we also have, there's a natural authority we have over each other. And this is based upon physical laws. So, for example, the fact that when I talk, the sound, the air is moved, and then it acts upon your eardrums is a sign that I can actually act upon you. So there's a certain level of authority that we play mutually upon each other. This is one of the reasons why binding prayers actually work for people. And this is that structure is actually why, under some rare circumstances, People who are Buddhists or Muslims or that type of thing can actually exercise people. Now, usually they only aggravate their problems, usually. But once in a while, they can actually drive a demon out based upon that. But that being the case, it means that um, in relationship to ourselves, we actually gain greater authority over our body but in two ways. One, by... Um, or principally by uh, virtue. So the more you subordinate or subject your body, the more authority you actually end up, they're able to command over it. And as a result, of, that's one of the reasons too why the demons don't want to get involved in it. But the second thing is, is you can indirectly gain more control or authority of your body by helping your guardian angel and any other angels and saints to act upon you. So one of the things that you can do is to pray to your guardian angel daily. You know, when you say to light, rule, and guard, and guide, that actually what you're doing is, is you're setting up, and you, you do it regularly, you're actually empowering him to actually act upon you. The exact opposite is the case with mantras that you get in these other religions. People, you know, they sit there and, and they do it over and over and over again. Well, what happens is people get a kind of a buzz out of it. Part of that's because there's usually some physiological reaction that people have. But in the process of that, demons can actually get involved in that and actually affect them as a result of it. And it's because of the fact that they're doing something disordered. And so as they do it disordered, the demons gain more control over them. And the opposite is the case in relationship to prayer. The more you pray, the more you actually can gain control over your body because you can actually have, ask um, God to help you to have more authority over it. But you can also ask, the, ask your angels, the, like St. Michael, your guardian angel particularly. He, he has given a limited authority over you from the get-go, because as soon as he's assigned you, he has a limited authority. But there's a he only has a certain amount, and you can you can actually increase that by how much you pray to him. A lot of times, people, you know, my guardian angel doesn't do anything for me. Well, when did you do anything to help him out? And that's the question you have to ask. Um, so this is something in which if you pray to him regularly and ask him to help you and guide you, he will. Um, which is also one of the things which this prayer for commission of the care of body and soul will do over the course of time. It'll it continue, it empowers them to actually help you and to keep the demons at bay type of thing. Then once particular patrons, like the patron saint of your name, I get majorly annoyed when parents do not name their kid after some saint because of the fact that you're robbing the kid. By naming them after a saint, the kid actually gets the patronage of the saint, so the saint will actually look out for them for a certain degree. But anyway, this is one of the reasons why you name your kid after, so that they have, but patrons are not just your name, your, the, what you're named after. It's also, um, and sometimes two people say, oh, well, my name's Austin. There's no St. Austin. Well, Austin's a contraction of Augustus. So sometimes you have to look these things up to find out what your name actually is. Um, there's also the patrons from your confirmation. You should be praying to him, to him or her regularly. You should be um, praying to 
the saint of the location in which you go to mass regularly, in this case it's the Immaculate Conception, or if you go to St. Cecilia's or something like that, you pray to, that, to her regularly. The patron saint of the diocese, in this case is St. Cecilia, and the patron saint of the country that you live in, which in this case is the Immaculate Conception, so we got doubled up here. Um, there's also the, the patron saints of the people in your family. You should be developing a devotion to this, the guardian angels of the other people in your family, especially your husbands or your wives, because of the fact that um, there's a close connection to you now because of the whole marriage thing, which I mentioned before. Um, then there's usually, of course, certain saints that people have a fondness for, such as in my case, although he's my confirmation saint, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, I like St. Augustine, St. Philomena. I like her principally because of the fact that they took, they took her off the New Right calendar. My attitude is, hey, she's a saint. She deserves some attention. <laughs> and, and the reasons for taking her off, which is completely illegitimate. And it's the same thing with St. Christopher. You know, they took him off the New Right calendar. I'm like, what's up with that? <laughs> so anyway, um, and then they have, uh, there's a, yeah, but you, what you do is you go through the various, and you, you pray to them regularly. Um, St. Anthony is a good one for me. He's, um, if there's any object that is recoverable, he's always given me the information where it's at within 24 hours. Now, that I might... I have a couple of what you to pray for before, will you? Yeah, well, <laughs> he's not the, he's, I'm not his favorite by any stretch of the imagination. St. Anthony has a fondness for women. Yeah, I love Anthony. He always wants everything. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, all the women I know that pray to him after devotion, they get everything they want out of the guy. <laughs> and... Well, um, it's not wrong. Yeah, and well, like let me give you an example. There's this woman who um, who uh, was my roommate's sister. If she just prayed to him for just a couple of seconds, she could find whatever it was, just almost instantaneously. So one time she was, they were at this restaurant, and she was praying, or she was in talking to somebody, and they're out looking for their mother's wedding ring, which was lost in a parking lot filled with gravel. Now your odds of finding that are pretty astronomical. So they go to her and they say, you know, would you please come and help us look for this thing? So she prayed to St. Anthony, walked straight out, picked it up, handed it to her mother, went back in and started talking to this person. So anyway, the point is, is that he has a certain fondness. So the point is that the more you pray to them, the more you can empower them to actually protect you, to help you, to enlighten you, to avoid them, and that type of thing. So these are the, okay, so these are some of the basic means that you can use to help ward off the demonic. And... It's stuff that you should be engaging in the spiritual battle every day. I mean, this is part of our our fight as as followers of Christ. So, okay. Any questions? Um, yeah. Only on the holy water. So, like the holy water uses that authority thing. Does that go with the holy water too? Then, or can children mm. bless parents or? Right no, they shouldn't bless their parents because it doesn't follow right order. So it, is, it should be all everything should be in right order. Yeah. Also with the holy water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For the auxiliary, do you just become the member by starting a prayer, or do you have to go on the site and... No, you just start saying the prayers. They didn't want it to be a formal type of thing where they kept track of everybody and what was going on. And it's, so basically all you have to do is start saying the prayers and say them daily, and you, become, you enjoy the protection. So and it works. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous group. I've, um, I know of a... I, I think I've mentioned it here. I know a guy that he started saying those the night he started saying them, he, the witch that lived next door to him for years packed up and fled. Within two months, he had cleaned out, within a two-block radius, all the witches out of his neighborhood, just by saying those prayers. So, um, and I, other people have experienced similar things, but this is, this is the type of thing that... Um, I usually tell people, if you have somebody, not an in-law, but if you have somebody you want to get rid of, start saying these prayers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you should normally talk to a priest before you do this, just so he can ask you some basic questions. I normally don't suggest people get involved in this unless um, they're struggling with some really difficult times or they have a certain level of spiritual uh, life. If it's a type of thing that they have a hard time saying in the state of grace, maybe, if I know that they can be faithful to the prayers. But, um, and because, you know, sometimes you get people who are, you know, they... They, uh, they can't stay in the state of grace all, but they're trying to, you know, they want to be doing stuff that requires a certain level. Because this is, the thing about the auxilium is, is that usually when people get involved with it, the demons will go after some weakness they never knew they had. That's usually what happens. And so the other weaknesses, they got to contend with those weaknesses plus the other ones. 
On the other hand, if it's the type of thing that a person is struggling with, with, with demonic influence, sometimes I'll say, start saying this since you get the protection. You're going to deal with this other stuff as it comes along, but don't worry about it. Just keep, you know, keep faithful. Just keep doing it. If you just keep doing it over the course of time, it'll have its tremendous effect. The other thing I've noticed is that people that say this, it's usually about a three-month period. I don't know what it is, about two to three months, but it seems to be a magical number for some reason or another. Uh, don't, mm -hmm. don't, don't, don't use that word. Okay. But anyway, the point being is, is that after two to three months, usually this, this, this stripping process, purification process, if a person is doing it, is cooperating with it, it'll start to level out and they won't suffer those things anymore. So, and then they'll find a certain level of it. doesn't mean that um, the intensif intensification of their spiritual life isn't there. It's just that it's more manageable and it doesn't affect them as much. And they, they notice it, and so but it doesn't affect them as much. Okay, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sanctions, Supervos et Maniat Semper. Amen.